right, so that they're forced to buy another one, is at least another you know, 99 bucks that they have to spend. The problem is, of course, they're using your credit card, so, yeah. so it's a bit of a vicious circle. So there are things they can do, but unfortunately, you know, I guess we just have to try them and see. I, I like the way you think, but then we, we remember that interactive market in Ukraine, which was much bigger rogue software vendors take it down. Their revenue for their last year of operation was $160 million. So they got a four million bucks for Follow the money is something the FBI used against organized crime. So, so going after the money used makes, makes absolute sense. I guess I'll just see, I'm going to see the next question, and uh, it's just in one word. Uh, stuck <laughs> uh, we, we had a speaker yesterday who actually hypothesized that there could be a stuck step for SAP. Would we see a stuck step for mobile? What do you mean? A, a piece of malware, no one knows what it does, no one was actually badly affected by it, and the media wrote about it to the exclusion of all else that might have taught us about security. I think that's actually very likely. <laughs> that we will get, if we get some interesting mobile phone malware, then everyone will get a really interesting stuff that has some, wow, look, we now realize this, this is really crazy, this is targeting insert name of country of choice. We'll probably end up, people end up talking about it for months and months and months and months and ignoring the fact that there are guys in Russia right now making loads of money out, you know, just dying premium rent numbers, thank you very much. Paul, how would you possibly know that stocks that did not hurt anyone? How can I possibly just say it? Okay, let me say I consider it extremely unlikely that it struck its designated target. What would it mean designated target? Then? Yes. What do you think is designated target? <laughs> That's why I think it's extremely unlikely. Because unless someone, unless someone, the guy wrote it, says what it's called, I don't think we're going to find out. Yeah, I appreciate the point. But you know yeah. what I mean? And I do agree with you. I don't think we'll ever find out which was the target. That's, that's very important. Who or which country? But it's a great, to my mind, that is a great distraction from all the other problems we face. And it's like, oh gosh, this cyber war. It's almost like we want it to be cyber war uh, and ex explain the way as cyber war. Because that can sort of make us feel better because we'll think, well, that probably doesn't happen all the time. And it, to me, all that part of about the stocks now, it sort of demeaned the, the poor guys who've been hit by any number of other bits of sort of bad stuff going on the internet in the interim. And it's a little bit like if you have a bereavement in, if you have a bereavement in your family or someone, maybe not direct family, but you, you're close to, at the same time as some major celebrity dies, then, you know, everyone will feel sorry for <laughs> Princess Diana, but, you know, your cousin will be or they don't know really anymore. And I think the same sort of thing happens when we get this mass hysteria about one particular piece of malware, which is interesting, possibly important, but not collectively more important than everything else in security at the same time. I think you're downplaying it more than it deserves. I think it's, there's no question that it is important, because it is groundbreaking in many ways. Just what if that is targeting a highly complicated operation system for controlling factories and places like that? But, but that by itself is groundbreaking. I'm not downplaying the malware, I'm sort of downplaying the, the long-term general reaction to it, which you must admit is long after the thing first appeared. Well, what did they do? Yeah, so it's kind of... So, that, that, yeah, I hope, so I don't mean to downplay the, the interest and importance of the malware and what it teaches, what it might teach us about it, how we run our industrial control systems. Sorry. Yeah. So Paul's first answer. Right. But to what you're probably asking, which is to say, a targeted, what people are presuming is a highly targeted attack against a particular entity um, that utilized very somewhat sophisticated um, technologies. Yes. But it's not, it's not that getting a hype that is getting right now because it's the first we have actually gone about. The first time we've actually seen something like this, at least publicized to be an ass. Well, actually, you know, I think there has been what, what I would call mobile malware incident that is at least as interesting and important as Snuxnet, but it wasn't classified as malware, but it, it was done with the, with the connivance of a mobile phone operator. Like, Nick, are you correct if I get the details wrong? It was one of the, one of the Emirates yes. who, who deliberately, who inserted some law enforcement trojan into black verifications. Quite updated yeah, and, and luckily somebody noticed and they went, oh, we're 
it was sort of by like uh, something like it was a message, like an update on the yeah. regular update on the phone, and that's all. And it was a regular update because yeah. it was signed and blessed by the by the, the mobile phone operator. As one mentions, they had some noble intention in mind. And, uh, that was what they claimed, and then they went, okay, yeah, well, maybe we should have done that at the end of it. So there has been, you know, that's interesting news because it sort of undermines the allow us to the code signing model, and it also kind of helps us redefine what we mean by malware. I think uh, at the end of time, so we'll open up for one last question from the floor before we wrap things up. And yeah. that is an instruction, not a suggestion. <laughs> I think that's one. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. yeah. Uh, what is the potential impact with uh, primary users cloud computing, such as primary as a service? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that again? It's kind of a bit close right. to the mic. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. right. What do you think would that be a potential and impact if the primary primaries, uh, uses cloud computing, such as like uh, primary as a service, you know, security as a service? Would that be a primary as a service in the near future? We have a service. No. Well, that's sort of how the how the software yeah. industry works right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, that's the that's the problem. Right? It's a big joker. It used to be a tremendously high barrier. If you wanted to write, if you wanted to, to use uh, malicious code to uh, do something with your choice, which involved attacking another user, it took study and effort on your part, and now that barrier has been dropped dramatically, and so. Now we see these, you know, relatively growing epidemic proportions of computer uh, attacks, and we see, uh, we talked about in the opening here, uh, challenges to the industry and the way we've been attempting to secure systems. So it's already there. There's been a dramatic stratification and specialization of the uh, underground to the point where there's a proper economy, to point of services at different levels and transition points. Um, although it's, it's like any sort of underground market, it really operates uh, in an information vacuum, so that it's a highly perfect market. But other than that, it's already there. It's pretty fun stuff. Yeah, it, it, you think like a bot that I can rent time on to send spam is almost the sort of the, <laughs> the, the ultimate expression of a cloud service. So, you know, and fast flux DNS, where you have domain names move around all over the world, so you can quickly jump out of you know this server gets taken down, you can jump to another one. These are uh, another great example of resilience in crime where cloud. So I think we're, the answer to your question, I think, is we're already there. That's how that's how the cyber criminals work. We're seeing this in several different ways. We're seeing it both as like outsourcing of malware offering. A great example again yesterday from the presentation of my Posa, where the Spanish operators of the bot that were operating a bot of 12 on the uh, 30 million unique IP addresses in the, in the bot. So for big bot, then. these guys have no coding skills at all. They have outsourced all the coding to a bunch of Slovenians who actually develop this Spotify network bot that technology they were using. So it's complete outsourcing of malware development. And then when we look at the like, other definition of like, like, like as a service, like real cloud services. Think Greek.com, think Amazon Web Services. Well, we have cases where spammers have rented like cloud space to send spam from the hosting services like that. So, yes, they are absolutely. Possible. So, the point is in general that, for example, in many cases, cyber criminals, there are different groups of cyber criminals, they have different specializations, and they cooperate together in order to earn as much money as they can. So, that's the point. So, how can I actually go here? Any last of this? Well, we've seen in the past 25 years or so, um, if not longer, 30, 35 years, uh, is kind of, as Dennis noted earlier, um, already happening in the open cloud in a much compressed time space. We are uh, not to be a fatalist about it, but we are hopes, and let's eradicate everything in the DC situation. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for coming and for. touch on what Jose said earlier about these services. If you don't pay for the service, the cloud service like you know, whatever, Facebook, Gmail, Google Docs, you're not paying for it. Um, can you really trust it? Exactly. I mean, I mean, you are. We have to understand, we are not the customers of these services. People often think they are the customer of Google, they're the customer of, of Facebook. They're not. They are the commodity being sold, and the customer of these services are the advertisers, and then we pay for the services with, with, with the information we put in there. And then, of course, 
we didn't really touch much on privacy issues on this cloud service uh, at all. But that is one of the things that's, that's going to come back to bite us. And I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm totally looking forward to any presidential campaign anywhere in the world in 30 years from now. It's a 24 presidential campaign in the USA because you can go back and find the teenage drunken images of all the candidates because they're right now posting them to Facebook. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. Give me all the evidence you need. Oh. I guess the problem with your thing about crime work in the cloud is one of the one of the one of the key problems of the cloud. There's another problem for privacy of data held by organisations like Google and Facebook. Is the interesting thing about a cloud, except in some very special cases, I believe, where hail is involved. A cloud has no centre. It's it's sort of it's only very loosely organised. And if you've ever tried to ask someone from Google, you know, what is if, how long do you keep the data from the search that I did on the 14th of September 2007? They, firstly, they'll dodge the, seem to dodge the question, and secondly, they go, well, you know, I, I'm a technologist, you'll have to ask the privacy device. And that's, not, that's somebody else's problem. That's another part of the cloud, uh, you know, a fluffy thing floating somewhere else. So, it's the, for me, one of the things that I dislike about pure play, so called cloud computing or cloud services, is that lack of a clear center of a clear person who who takes responsibility. Uh, and for the fact that, that it's not, I, I don't like, I, I would change my mind on you know, the commodity. Really, it's, it's unpaid employee. Um, it's perhaps an even more aggressive way of putting it. And the sooner we recognize that, the, and, you know, the, the sooner we might be able to put pressure on the pure play cloud providers to be much more open and forthcoming about their attitudes to privacy and what they do with our data. Because at the moment, they, even if they want to, I'm not sure they could answer that question. When do we delete the data? Well, we don't know. It's stored in you know, 17 different data centers on 1,212,000 possible different servers, each with four disk drives. Uh, we're, we're not sure. We suspect it might be about two years, or more or less. So I think we have to do better than that. We can only do that by putting pressure on, on the cloud guys to come clean about privacy. Well, privacy is probably an issue to kind of next time around there. And we said that, I will reach the end of the session. Uh, thank you everybody for listening in. Thank you for your questions, which some of which came in on Twitter as well. And we have a big hand for all our four panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.